All right, so I'll go ahead and get started since it's three o'clock. Um, I'm going to talk about comorbidities in pediatric narcolepsy today. Um, you know, the title of my talk is um, Comorbidities in Pediatric Narcolepsy. Um, I'm a pediatric neurology sleep doc, so um, it's going to focus on kind of a pediatric presentation, but these are definitely things that are also applicable to adults with narcolepsy. Maybe just not as prevalent, but certainly um, if you're a grown up with narcolepsy, I think this would be useful information as well. So feel free to stick around. Um, so my name's Carrie Lockhart. I'm a pediatric sleep neurologist at Seattle Children's in Seattle. Um, my background's in neurology, and Dr. Carol Rosen was actually my mentor um, and my trainer. So I was so glad that she won the award today for the Physician of the Year. Um, and feel free to interrupt me if I start talking like medical jargon that you don't, you know, if I start saying acronyms or anything that um, you don't um, realize what I'm saying, then please interrupt me because sometimes it's just a habit and I'll go into that. All right, so the objectives of my talk today is I want to talk about the other stuff that comes with narcolepsy, not the, just the disruption in sleep and the daytime sleepiness, um, but all of the other things, because there are so many more other things. Um, so I want to talk about how this disorder affects your brain, affects your body, um, and also affects kind of social um, interactions and just everyday life. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the treatment options for those specific comorbidities or associated medical conditions that come with narcolepsy. <clears throat> so this is an interesting tidbit I like to share. Um, the term narcolepsy was actually coined in 1877 by somebody named Westfall. Um, and what it means or where it comes from is to seize with drowsiness. Um, and what causes narcolepsy? I'm sure you all have heard um, at least a little bit about this, but I'm going to get scientific um, on you for a few of these slides because I just think it's interesting and it helps kind of explain um, everything that's going on. So orexin and hypocretin, they're the same thing. Some um, of us lecturers are going to say hypocretin, some of us say orexin. I tend to use the word orexin, same thing. Um, and what narcolepsy is in humans is it's a loss of the neurons that produce orexin or hypocretin. Um, these are neurons that are found in our brain, um, specifically in the hypothalamus, which is kind of in the very middle part of the brain. And these neurons that make orexin project to lots of other areas of the brain, and that's why they affect your sleepiness and your kind of wakeful states. But I think what people don't realize is that these neurons also project to many other parts of the body. Um, the orexin system is one of the systems that has the most wide, widely projected neurons that we know of. And that's why there's so many other things that come with narcolepsy besides just a sleep-wake disorder. I also think it's interesting because orexin, that particular neurotransmitter, um, was discovered in 1998, and it was originally discovered um, in research with appetite and food intake, um, and it was named orexin because of that, after orexis, the Greek word for appetite. Um, so again, it just has a lot more to do with sleep-wake cycle. And this is just a picture of all the other areas of the body that orexin projects to, and this isn't all of them, but these are the key features. So it goes to adipose tissue or fat cells, goes to your GI tract, goes to your adrenal cortex, goes to your gonads, or those are your reproductive organisms, pancreas, um, and so much more. So just briefly, um, Chad talked about, that this, about this this morning, the classic pentad of narcolepsy, um, sleepiness, sleep fragmentation or disrupted sleep, hypnagogic or pompic hallucinations that can also occur during the day as well, sleep paralysis and cataplexy. Um, and you guys all know that you don't have to have all of those. Um, everybody with narcolepsy is going to be sleepy, um, but only about 25% about of people with narcolepsy are going to have all five of those. What I want to talk about more today is the further pediatric considerations um, and things that can happen in adults too. So specifically the ones that I'm going to address are the metabolic perturbations, so obesity and precocious puberty, the autonomic disturbances, your autonomic system is um, the part of your central nervous system that does things unconsciously, like your breathing and your heart rate and things like that. Um, so some of the autonomic disturbances in narcolepsy is something called POTS, or positional orthostatic tachycardic syndrome, um, and blood pressure regulation is affected in narcolepsy. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about problems with social interactions and academic performance or attention in kids, but this can also kind of relate to job performance and attention in adults. Um, and then psychiatric comorbidities or mood disorders that come with narcolepsy. About 43% of children with narcolepsy are found to have another psychiatric comorbidity or um, mental illness or mood disorder. Um, most of the time it's something that has to do with reward seeking behavior, addiction or impulsivity, but also um, motivational behavior, things like depression because, um, because of the orexin deficiency itself. Um, I do want to touch just a little bit more on excessive daytime sleepiness. Um, all of you guys with narcolepsy obviously know what this is. This is more for um, relatives and friends um, of people with narcolepsy or teachers and things like that because um, excessive daytime sleepiness can really manifest in many different ways. Um, I think the classic thinking with narcolepsy, at least when I first started to learn about it, was sleep attacks. You know, you just kind of all of a sudden fall asleep uncontrollably. That definitely happens, but also just chronic drowsiness, feeling sleepy all the time. Um, one of my patients told me that having narcolepsy means they're never really awake and they're never really asleep. Um, other ways that sleepiness can manifest are with automatic behaviors. Um, one of my patients said it's like sleeping with my eyes open. Um, I can relate to this a little bit um, because when I was in residency and working about 80 hours a week and I was at my sleepiest, you know, I would get home from work and then I would think, did I take the freeway or did I drive local routes? I don't really even know. It's just so automatic um, that I did it. So just those automatic behaviors that you do without thinking. Brain fog. Um, this is related to excessive daytime sleepiness. It can be a manifestation of excessive daytime sleepiness, and it can also be its own kind of cognitive impairment. But one of my patients said, it feels like there's a fuzzy barrier between you and the rest of the world, or it feels like my brain is running at half speed, just really, really slowly, and you're aware of how slowly your brain is kind of moving. Um, and then memory and focus problems, um, feeling scatterbrained, feeling disorganized, um, so, just again, a lot of different ways that that sleepiness can kind of portray itself. Um, and this can be, this is important because it's a major source of academic stress for kids, for teens, um, and it causes a lot of difficulties. And um, a lot of the kids that I see with excessive daytime sleepiness have developed kind of their own unconscious coping mechanisms to stay awake, and sometimes that works to their, you know, it's, it's really helping them stay awake, but then it can give them a bad rap because in class they're fidgeting all the time and moving around and getting up, um, and that keeps them awake, but it can be a distraction um, or just talking a lot and things like that um, to stay awake. Okay, so now kind of we're gonna move um, into the meat of my presentation, and the first comorbidity I wanna talk about is weight gain and narcolepsy. Um, so studies show that, at least in kids, when symptoms of excessive sleepiness start to surface, um, rapid weight gain is also a very common presentation. Um, I was listening to one of the moms say that her daughter gained about 40 pounds in two months and um, wasn't even eating anything. And it, it can occur in about in up to 84% of children, and I see this a lot in um, the kids that I have in my practice. So why does this happen? I'm gonna get scientific again. Um, we don't really know is the short answer, but there's a few different theories and there's research out there, a lot of which is conflicting, um, but nonetheless is giving us a lot of clues as to why this happens. Um, so I think the easy answer or the first kind of theory was, well, we know that people with narcolepsy have fragmented sleep. And we know from studies in people with obstructive sleep apnea who have fragmented sleep because of breathing problems, um, or any other reason you're not getting enough sleep at night, then that affects your metabolic rate, and it can, and can cause you to gain weight, and then it can, cause it, it can make it harder to lose weight. So we know in people with obstructive sleep apnea, once they're treated, then they say they're doing the same kind of physical exercise, but now the weight is starting to come off. So again, one of the theories is that this rapid weight gain happens because of the actual sleep disruption, and I think that's true, but I think there's more to it. Um, Again, the neurotransmitter orexin um, has a key role in appetite regulation. So those neurons that produce orexin from our hypothalamus, um, they come from a few different areas of the hypothalamus. The ones coming from the dorsomedial part, those are the ones that project to the arousal regions of the brain. 
But the neurons that come from the more lateral part of the hypothalamus, they are projecting to areas in our bodies that control our food intake. Um, and studies show that orexin levels um, when they're tested, at least in animal models, um, negatively correlate with the level of, of obesity. Um, so the less orexin you have, the more likely you are to be obese, again, at least in rats. Um, <clears throat> there's also studies that interestingly show that um, weight increase in narcoleptics is um, independent of caloric intake. So there's a lot of studies um, in rat models and some in people that show that a narcoleptic person is eating the same amount as somebody without narcolepsy, they're going to gain more weight or they're just going to be heavier in general. Um, the key reason, we think, is because um, of resting energy expenditure. That's lower in narcoleptic patients than um, in people without narcolepsy. Um, we also know that just in general, in healthy subjects, orexin has a natural tendency to decline with age that parallels the increase in adipose tissue and reduced food intake and increased satiety or fullness um, in elderly individuals. So these are all just kind of key pieces of evidence that it has to do with orexin itself. So let me talk a little bit more about these studies um, <clears throat> in rats. And, excuse me. Okay, so um, this was a study that um, took mice or rats and um, in one group, they gave them orexin or an orexin agonist. And what they found was that food intake increased a little bit, but what really increased was physical activity. The more orexin that these rats got, the more active they were, and that resulted in weight loss. Then they took rats and they kind of blocked their orexin or uh, made a model with loss of orexin function. Food intake went down a little bit, but what really went down was physical activity. So that resulted in weight gain. And again, the severity of obesity increased as the orexin function declined. And females seemed to be more greatly affected than males, um, unsure why. So the overall kind of gist is that rats with more orexin, um, the not narcoleptic rats, ate a little bit more but had a ton more physical activity. So they were resistant to becoming obese and they also had better sleep quality. Rats with decreased orexin or the narcoleptic model ate a little bit less, but they had significantly less physical activity, so they were more prone to obesity and they had worse sleep quality. There's other reasons that we think um, narcolepsy, excuse me, narcoleptics um, are, um, have a tendency to be obese, and that's because orexin um, plays a role and kind of interacts with something called leptin. Leptin is a compound that's produced by fat cells, and it signals satiety or fullness. So when you're eating, your fat cells are actually producing leptin, and then they kind of say, hey, you're full now, stop eating. Um, and then there's also a circadian rhythm to leptin. Um, there's, um, there's usually kind of a blunt of leptin production in the evening hours, um, and that blunt is reduced if, you have, um, if you're sleep deprived. And then if you're orexin deficient, you also have a blunting of that late evening leptin peak. So, um, so we know that people with narcolepsy tend to have unhealthy eating habits. Um, and again, even though they're t kind of taking in the same amount of calories overall as somebody without narcolepsy, um, it's the way that they're taking in these calories. Um, and part of that is maybe because of this reduced um, leptin peak in the evening hours. So you eat a lot before bedtime, and then you go to sleep, and your body's not burning all of those calories off. And then also for poor food choices, excuse me. So orexin also plays a role in reward-seeking behavior. Um, <clears throat> and studies show that people with narcolepsy um, may tend to gravitate a little bit more towards the comfort foods, a little bit more towards the really yummy and healthy foods. Um, so again, caloric intake could be the same, but it's more unhealthy, unhealthy calories. And people with narcolepsy tend to have a little bit less of physical kind of drive or physical activity overall. So in somebody who's very active, if they're eating a lot of carbohydrates and sugars, they're burning them off. But if you're not very active, those carbohydrates and sugars change into fat really quickly and cause weight gain. And then some studies even show that binge eating is a little bit more prevalent in people with narcolepsy, probably again because of the kind of reward feeling um, that you get when you're eating a lot of really yummy food. So all of these things I think play a role, <coughs> excuse me, in addition to just feeling sleepy and the sleep disruption. 
And here's another interesting study that I wanted to touch base on. So shred, <coughs> excuse me. So shred is sleep-related eating disorder. Um, it's nocturnal consumption of food or even toxic substances that are not even, you know, meant to be eaten. Um, and studies show that this is more common in narcoleptic patients than in the general population. Still very rare in both, but a little bit more common in narcolepsy. Why do we think that is? A couple different theories. Maybe it's because of the medications a lot, a lot of narcoleptics are on during the day, the stimulants that are reducing your appetite. So then you become really hungry at night, and this can manifest as sleep-related eating. As I mentioned, orexin deficiency blunts the late-night peak in leptin. And then orexin deficiency impairs impulse control <clears throat> via the dopamine pathways. So if you're feeling hungry at night and you don't have narcolepsy, maybe you're not going to act on that impulse. But if you do, because of orexin deficiency, have narcolepsy, you'll act on that impulse and you'll eat more at night than maybe you should. Um, and interestingly, um, sleep-related eating disorder has been shown to improve um, with dopamine treatment like Pramipexol. So in summary, obesity is because of de decreased energy expenditure or physical activity, decreased fullness, poor food choices and unhealthy eating habits, in addition to just the disrupted sleep. So, yes? No, that's an excellent point. No, I think that's an excellent point, and I think that's very accurate, because not only are those maybe the foods that taste a little bit more yummy, but they're going to give you that immediate reward of feeling better and feeling more energized you know, sooner after you eat them than maybe protein, which will give you more energy long term, but you don't feel that kind of increase right away. So I think that's an excellent way to think about it. <coughs> Sorry, I'm dying here. Okay, so what do you do about it? The most important thing is to just be aware of it. Make sure that you're making healthy choices. Make sure that you're eating a well-balanced diet. Stay on a routine eating schedule. Um, fortunately, stimulants tend to reduce appetite, so that can be helpful during the day. But again, be careful if you're feeling really hungry at night. Sodium oxalate has also been shown to help um, kids weight go back to their pre-narcolepsy levels. So that's what this graph kind of shows. The first arrow is um, when a child was diagnosed with narcolepsy, and then you see shortly after they kind of had an abrupt weight gain. But then the second arrow is when Zyrem was started, and weight went back down, and it went back down to kind of level out around the red curve where it was before the narcolepsy diagnosis. <clears throat> but if you're really struggling, I think you should advocate for a nutrition consult. I do this a lot um, because it's, it's really hard to know kind of <clears throat> how to balance your diet, you know, every day and what to eat. So, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> so that can be helpful. <clears throat> okay. So next I want to talk about precocious puberty. This is something that I see a lot in my narcoleptic narcolepsy, narcolepsy kids as well. And it can occur in about 17% of patients with narcolepsy. And by precocious puberty, I mean early onset puberty. So early onset of things like hair growth, breast development in girls, voice change or muscle growth in boys. And even though it's only in 17% of people with narcolepsy, that's a thousand times higher than the general population. Why does this happen? Again, we don't know the exact mechanisms and pathways. Um, one question is, does it happen because of increased body fat? Um, because we know in the general population, if you, take, if you take kids who are overweight and compare them to kids who have a normal BMI, they're more likely to have precocious puberty. However, um, when studies were done in narcoleptic patients, regardless of if they were overweight or not, 
um, precocious puberty was more prevalent in kind of each group. So it has to do with more than just the amount of body fat. Um, and the little figure I showed in the beginning of the presentation, um, I showed that orexin does actually project to, um, to our sex hormones or our puberty hormones, reproductive hormones. And orexin promotes gonadotropin releasing hormone, which is a sex hormone regulator um, that's crucial in pubertal timing. So again, I think it's because of the orexin deficiency itself versus just other things that come along with it. So, so I also wanted to say, um, if you're at your sleep doctor and they're asking you science or asking you questions about puberty or hair or you know breast development or things like that, don't think that they're just kind of being weird, but it can be important to help diagnose narcolepsy and then to also know what we should um, be looking for and what we need to treat. Um, so usually the treatment um, is first to just you know observe um, over about six to 12 months. Um, but if the signs of puberty are still um, progressing earlier than they should, um, then it's really important to see an endocrinologist um, because they can do kind of more extensive lab work to make sure all of your hormones are where they need to be. And if not, if there's any medications that need to be started. Um, usually the endocrinologists like to see the kids I refer them to with true precocious puberty about every six months. Um, and the, reasons it, the reason it's so important to kind of get a workup for this um, and to make sure it's treated is um, not only to kind of slow the process down just for the sake of slowing it down, like preventing menarche um, and slowing the development of secondary sex characteristics in a young child, but it's to make sure that, you're, that your overall growth um, kind of excels <clears throat> the way it should. So, um, if you have precocious puberty and that kind of goes without being treated, your growth plates and your bones can close earlier than they should. So you're not going to grow as much as you would um, had you been treated or something like that. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. So the next thing I want to talk about is obstructive sleep apnea. And this occurs in about a quarter of adult patients with narcolepsy. We don't have good data to show how many kids with narcolepsy have it. So why do I want to, so first, what is OSA, or obstructive sleep apnea? It's breathing pauses in sleep. The most common symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea are snoring, breathing pauses, but some other really su subtle symptoms can be a dry mouth in the morning, restless sleep, or nocturnal diaphoresis, or sweating at night, waking up kind of drenched. Um, this is important because short term, it makes you sleepier, um, and long term, it's bad for your heart and for your brain. Um, I'm sure that a lot of people with narcolepsy may have been diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea before they were diagnosed with narcolepsy. Um, so it's, um, it's important to kind of distinguish the two, and in somebody with obstructive sleep apnea, we need to continue to look for narcolepsy if they're sleepy. But in somebody with narcolepsy, I think we should also continue to look for obstructive sleep apnea if they're sleepy despite medications. So why does obstructive sleep apnea happen in narcoleptics more so than in the general population? Well, a big one is because a lot of narcoleptics are overweight, and the more overweight you are, the more at risk you are for obstructive sleep apnea. Because what's happening in OSA is your throat or your airway is closing up when you're asleep. So the more weight you have in the area of your airway and around your neck, your chin, whatever, the more likely it's going to close up. But there's more to it than just being overweight. Um, and I kind of talked about this already. OK, so what's the more to OSA and narcolepsy? <clears throat> so orexin itself directly contributes to, the res to respiratory regulation. The neurons from the brain go to the midbrain, which, is, which part of the midbrain is the breathing center, and they also go to the hypoglossal and the phrenic nerves. The hypoglossal nerve is your nerve that innervates your tongue, <coughs> and your phrenic nerves are the nerves that innervate your, di innervate your diaphragm. So <coughs> orexin itself plays a critical role in coordination between your upper airway and your thoracic pump muscles. Um, 
the way that your body knows how to breathe when you fall asleep um, is partly because of orexin. Um, orexin is also essential for maintenance of your um, airway patency. So what it does is when it innervates your tongue muscles, it activates kind of your pre-inspiratory activity of your tongue. So when you breathe in, your tongue kind of goes down and opens up your airway and keeps it patent. Um, but if you're orexin deficient, your tongue is going to be a little bit more floppy than it should. It can close up your airway. You can get sleep apnea. Almorexant, which is um, a medication that's used to treat insomnia, it's an orexin antagonist, um, has also been found to decrease breathing pauses in sleep. So just another clue that there really is something about orexin itself that has to do with the way you breathe versus just being overweight. Let me go back real quick. Um, they're everywhere. So, um, yeah, they're everywhere. So a lot of these receptors are in other parts of the brain, um, in your frontal lobe, in other um, kind of cortex areas. They're in your midbrain, which is um, the area that controls your breathing at night when I'm specifically talking about obstructive sleep apnea. Um, the neurons actually travel to fat cells and release orexin that acts on fat cells. The neurons travel to your GI tract, they travel to your adrenal cortex. So they go so many different places in the body. They're not just kind of localized to the brain. So, you know, that's what we're working on, right? Um, so that's what would be great because all of the medications out there right now that are treating narcolepsy, none of them specifically work on orexin. Um, and that's what we need. And I think it's promising that we have this almorexin, which is the opposite. It's to treat insomnia. It's an orexin um, antagonist, so you can build up, with this medication, you get more orexin, or I'm sorry, less orexin in your body. Um, but we need something that gives you kind of orexin. So, yeah. That was your question. Okay. So, <clears throat> So make sure that your sleep doctor, if you're still feeling sleepy and you're treated for your narcolepsy with medications, make sure that your sleep doctor is asking you if you snore or if there's other signs of obstructive sleep apnea. Because um, you probably don't know if you snore. Most people don't know that they snore. So maybe, you know, check in with mom or dad, have them just kind of listen in or anybody else that may be around while you're sleeping. Um, and if somebody is telling you that you snore, um, then um, to look into the sleep apnea piece. Um, and kids who have sleep apnea, just to talk about the treatment a little bit, um, the mainstay of treatment is usually getting adenoids and tonsils out. Um, because that just opens up your airway. Your tonsils and your adenoids are going to make it, if they're big especially, going to make it more or easier for your airway to close up. So taking them out opens it up. But there's other ways. If you've already had a tonsillectomy or if your tonsils aren't very big, um, there's orthodontic intervention, so specifically palate expansion. Um, if you have a high arched or a narrow palate, that's another um, thing that can just make your airway narrower, so expanding it. Um, with like a retainer or orthodontic device can open up your airway more. And then CPAP, the machine that you wear when you're sleeping, is another way to treat sleep apnea. And there's also adjunctive treatments. Um, sleep apnea is worse if you have a lot of allergies because if your nose is clogged, then that can just increase the amount of breathing pauses you have. Um, and then weight management, of course, because if you have more weight around your neck, it's going to make it easier for your airway to close up. Okay, so moving on. The next thing I want to talk about is ADHD. And I should really say ADHD and or ADHD-like symptoms. Um, so children with narcolepsy, about 29% of them, um, <clears throat> up to 29% of them, have a comorbid diagnosis of ADHD. Whether this is true, narcolepsy and ADHD, or narcolepsy causing the same symptoms of ADHD, it's hard to kind of tease out. Um, and also in adult patients, um, ADHD or ADHD-like symptoms is about 8 to 15 times higher um, than the normal population. So why is that? Um, again, all of my slides, we don't really know exactly why, um, but here are the theories. Um, so at least when we're talking about ADHD in kids, there's um, the hypoarousal theory, meaning that um, kids who are really sleepy um, 
rather than kind of doing what adults do and kind of just becoming couch potatoes, um, they counteract that with increased motor activity. They move around a lot and fidget a lot to keep themselves awake. And that looks like ADHD, um, being hyper um, and inattentive. Um, but I think there's more to it than just being sleepy because, as I was just kind of saying, orexin also goes um, to the prefrontal cortex, which is, which is the part of our brain that has to do with our attention system. It's the part of our brain that makes us focus and keeps our attention. And if you don't have enough orexin going to that part of the brain, um, then that could um, be why it's harder to pay attention. And then orexin also has connections with the RAS, or reticular activating system. That's a system in our brainstem that helps us filter out kind of the um, unnecessary stuff. So the people talking next door, you're kind of filtering that out as you're listening to me because of your reticular activating system. Um, and orexin goes to that system. So if you're orexin deficient, then maybe it's harder to filter, filter out the background stimuli and then makes it harder to pay attention and focus. Um, and this is just a graph of ADHD-like symptoms. Um, the white is controls, um, the light kind of blue is narcolepsy without cataplexy, and then the darker blue is narcolepsy with cataplexy. And this is talking about actual like diagnosis of ADHD versus just inattentive symptoms or hyperactive or impulsive symptoms. Um, and it's just showing that compared to controls, um, the blue graphs are much higher. So people with narcolepsy, whether or not you have cataplexy, um, you have more tendency to have those ADHD-like symptoms. So treatment. Um, I always make ADHD treatment part of a 504 plan that I'll recommend for my kids with narcolepsy. Um, a lot of my patients get really excited that they're allowed to have fidget spinners in class. Sometimes um, I'll have them kind of put a Velcro strip under their desk, a silent one, and you can kind of take it off and put it back on again. Something that kind of discreetly keeps your body moving um, to help you stay awake. Um, stimulants, um, as a lot of other lectures have pointed out, those are treatments for both ADHD and narcolepsy, so it's fortunate that those can help. Um, and then sometimes um, we'll use non-stimulants in kids with narcolepsy. Clonidine and, gu and guanfacine are non-stimulant medications that are used to treat ADHD. I tend, I put them on the slide because I see a lot of kids who have narcolepsy on clonidine or guanfacine. Um, I found that they're not the best options because um, they're REM suppressants. So even though it can help with attention, it can be kind of counteractive in that you're not getting as much REM overnight. Um, and then um, you're feeling more sleepy during the day. Um, but, but in some kids, they, they really do say that these medications are helpful for them. OK, next. <clears throat> I want to talk about um, depression, because this is a big one. It's the most common um, mood disorder that I see in children with narcolepsy. Um, and about 20% of pediatric patients with narcolepsy also meet criteria for depression. Um, and I think it's important because I think it's a big barrier um, sometimes to medication compliance or just um, motivation um, to beat the disease, to kind of continue on with treatment and know that you can kind of get above it. Um, so anyway, um, one lecturer talked about how um, depression a long time ago, um, we really focused a lot on um, REM sleep cycles in people with depression, and we know that people who have depression, regardless of whether or not you have narcolepsy, um, have more REM sleep at night, and they go into REM sleep faster. Um, and we know that antidepressant medications like SSRIs and SNRIs, they're REM suppressants. So there's something that has to do with REM sleep and depression. Um, and the more REM sleep you get, or maybe the more disrupted and less consolidated it is, um, maybe the more likely you are to have depression. Um, yes? So I think what I've noticed in my particular clinic is that depression, unlike sleepiness and weight gain, 
tends to be something that, well, no, I take that back. I was going to say it tends to surface later, but I take that back. Um, I think it's pretty prevalent in a lot of my kids with narcolepsy. Does that answer your question? or? I think it will surface itself in the kids that I see um, the vast majority of the time. I would say in the kids that I see, um, more than 20% um, have depression or depressive-like symptoms. And, and I think a lot of that is maybe, you know, because of the diagnosis itself and what that means and how do you kind of grasp that and cope with it because it is a lifelong disorder. So I think a lot of it has to do with just that, but I don't think it's only that. I think that it's the actual deficiency of orexin itself um, that um, because it's not going to the parts of your brain that regulate your mood, um, without that orexin, you just feel more depressed. Does that answer your question? Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, so even though these studies show that 20% um, or one in five of um, kids with narcolepsy have depression, that's about three times higher than the general pediatric population, at least in the study that was done in Sweden. Um, so why is that? Um, I talked a little bit about just getting the diagnosis. That can be depressing. Um, sleepy, if you're sleepy all the time, if you're just struggling to make it through the day, that can, have, you know, that can be depressing. If your sleep is fragmented, if you're not getting good REM cycles when you're supposed to be getting those REM cycles, that um, probably leads to um, feeling depressed. But again, I think it's the erection itself because it projects to areas of the brain that regulate mood, um, specifically the amygdala. Um, and, it, and it interacts with all those transmitters that are defective in um, depression, like dopamine and norepinephrine and such. So, um, so it's that neurotransmitter. Um, it's missing that neurotransmitter that also causes the depression. So treatment. Um, the mainstay is antidepressants. Um, and, oh, go ahead. You know, I agree, and that's what I see in my practice. Um, I don't have numbers that I can give you right now, um, but I would hope that there's studies out there that show those numbers because it's there and it's real. Um, and that's part of what delays the diagnosis too, because if um, you do present with symptoms of depression or get diagnosed with depression, and you start SSRIs or SNRIs, then it's gonna affect your MSLT or your NAP test. So. Um, so I think that's a great point, and I, I, I agree. I think that it's out there, and I think that it's real, um, and I think that it's a problem, whether it's misdiagnosis or just something that's a concurrent diagnosis that, de that then delays the true diagnosis. Did that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, and I think it's a double-edged sword because on that note, you know, we talk a lot about 504 plans and special school accommodations, and I have a lot of kids who when I say, you get to nap after lunch or in, you know, fifth period, they're really excited, and I have other kids that are like, no, I don't want people to know that I'm going to go nap, and I don't want to go out of class and have people, you know, like know that. So, so the accommodations can help, but then they can also just make somebody feel a little bit different and a little bit odd. Um, and so, I, yeah, I agree. And I think maybe another, you know, possible kind of um, factor in depression um, 
in, you know, is the delay in diagnosis and not knowing what's wrong and thinking or maybe hearing that you're lazy or that you're faking cataplexy or um, things like that. Um, so that all, I think, kind of intertwines and plays a role. Yeah. 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 No, I think that's a great question because you're right. Taking narcolepsy completely out of the picture, if you're depressed, you're going to have more risk taking um, behaviors and more impulsivity. Um, and to add to your comment about um, um, about behaviors that kids demonstrate, driving is also another one. So you know, impulsivity with regards to. Um, um, nighttime eating, but impulsivity behind the wheel or risk-taking behaviors like speeding and being a little bit more dangerous are also worrisome. So what to do about it? I think number one is talk about it. Make sure your sleep doctor asks about it. Um, if they don't ask about it, make sure to tell him or her about it. Um, and to know that it's something that comes with narcolepsy and it's not your fault. Um, and that's why I really kind of hone in on it's the deficiency of this neurotransmitter that is making you feel this way. So I would say talk about it, number one, accept it, number two, and treat it, number three. Um, and treating it, did you, were you going to treat it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. It is. Yeah. No, it's hard. And it's like a double edged sword, like the 504 plan. It's helping you in some ways and hindering you maybe in others if it's making you feel like an odd man out. Um, and that's, that's tough. I think that just, I think it's fortunate that the SSRIs and the SNRIs are like twofers, twofers meaning they can treat cataplexy and they can treat depression. Um, because there's still a huge, you know, there's a stigma about narcolepsy, but there's also a stigma about depression. Um, and, and I do have some kids that will take an SSRI for cataplexy, but they won't take it for depression. Um, and so I think maybe just, um, just being aware of how you feel and um, be willing to go through with medical treatment. And then also, um, I talk a lot about counseling and maybe visiting a therapist or a psychologist, um, just so that you have an outlet and somebody to talk to. And I think support groups like the Ambassador Program here um, and just meeting other kids and things like that so you can vent and talk and share your story um, can also do wonders um, as treatment. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that covered my um, my next point: the counseling and therapy. I think I think that um, I think it's hard because you know a lot of kids will say, "Well, I don't want to go talk to a stranger," or "I'm not like." It, it, I get a lot of resistance, but in all of my kids who have found a therapist that they like, and I think that's another thing is when you go to find a therapist, you need to find somebody that you like and that you click with because if it's just not the right fit, you're not going to share what's really going on and you're not going to get that kind of therapeutic talking um, about it. All right. Um, oh, why didn't that? Okay, so the last thing I added on is um, autonomic dysfunction. Um, thank you. Um, so um, I added this on last minute because I heard a few other people um, talk about um, POTS and blood pressure regulation and things like that. So um, I found a study that um, took 15 narcoleptic patients um, and compared them to controls. Um, and what they did was they just administered a, a questionnaire to assess for autonomic system um, symptoms, excuse me, um, and a whole bunch of things came up. So cardiovascular symptoms, GI symptoms, um, and thermoregulation. So um, this is something else to talk to your sleep doctor with and that may need an outside referral because your sleep doctor might not feel comfortable treating all of these things. Um, 
So orthostatic symptoms, that's like when you get up from laying down and you feel lightheaded or dizzy um, or you feel faint. Um, it's kind of nice because the mainstay of treatment for things like those is increased water intake and increased salt intake. So sodium oxabate can kind of help with that a little bit indirectly probably. Um, GI symptoms, um, so there's a couple rat models that show that people with orexin, excuse me, deficiency have slower gastric emptying um, than rats without orexin deficiency. Um, so what that means is you can have a greater tendency to be constipated, um, or these studies even said that you kind of feel full sooner. So again, it might not be great to talk about constipation to your sleep doc, or you might wonder why your sleep doc is asking about constipation, but that's why. Um, thermal regulation, Raynaud's phenomenon, feeling cold in your hands and feet, um, that's something that's also very common in um, a lot of narcoleptic patients that I have. Um, and again, I think all of this is because of the decrease or deficiency in orexin, because orexin goes to each one of these systems um, within our body. Um, this is just, I'm going to go over this really quick, because I think it's a really interesting slide, being a neurologist, and this is kind of um, getting scientific again. But I mentioned that orexin innervates your tongue muscles. Um, that's partly probably um, why you get tongue thrusting or cataplectic facies with cataplexy in children. Um, orexin goes to your trigeminal nerve, which is the nerve that innervates your jaw. That could be why you see jaw dropping in cataplectic facies. Um, it goes to something called your gigantocellular reticular nucleus, which um, involves your muscle tone. Um, and when I see any sleepy teenager, um, if they're not screaming obstructive sleep apnea, saying they snore and have breathing pauses, and I don't know why they're sleepy, I always assess their tone um, because hypotonia or just being a little bit more floppy can be the first sign of cataplexy. Um, and what else do I want to say? Orexin goes to your cerebellum. Cerebellum um, is the part of your the brain, the back part of your brain that has to do with motor learning and motor execution. Um, so, um, so, you know, there's studies out there that maybe show that people with narcolepsy are just a little bit clumsier than people without narcolepsy, again, because of where orexin is going to your brain. Um, and anyway, I just think that's kind of interesting. And that's it. Other questions? Yeah, so kids with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, so that's a connectivity, um, connective tissue disorder, um, where your connective tissue, like your ligaments, um, are not as strong as they should be. That can cause hypotonia. Um, not only are your ligaments not as strong as they should be, but your blood vessels are a little bit more flexible than they should be, so that's why you get the POTS or the dizziness and lightheadedness kind of symptoms. I don't know of a direct connection, connection between narcolepsy and Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Um, that's not to say it's not out there, I just don't know of it. Um, but all of those autonomic symptoms that happen are similar. Does that answer your question? Okay. Ehlers-Danlos, so E-H-L-E-R-S, D-A-N-L-O-S. That's a good question. Um, so I guess the short answer is no, I don't know of any direct correlation, but I'm trying to think of my patients um, and whether or not. So the question was, um, are kind of sensory processing issues related to narcolepsy? Um, and um, my answer is I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So fibromyalgia itself, I, I bet that's a common misdiagnosis um, of narcolepsy. Whether or not there's a true association between true fibromyalgia and narcolepsy, I don't know. I don't see um, kids with fibromyalgia that much, but my adult neuro colleagues would probably know. But I'm gonna st I'll start asking my kids that because I see a lot of kids um, with sensory integration issues and yeah, that's an interesting thought. Yeah. Quickly, 
Oh. Uh huh. <coughs> the only one that I can think of that I came across when I was reading, and don't quote me on this because it's very controversial, but is anorexia. Um, and there's so I was I came upon that literature when I was um, researching things between um, or researching why orexin has to do with appetite. But I take that back because anorexia is less orexin, so never mind. Um, I don't know of any disorder in particular or any kind of known thing with overproduction of orexin in people. Okay, one more. I and you guys, you can come up to me afterwards too. <laughs> Go ahead. So, sure, so the question was growth and narcolepsy. So there's a definite clear correlation between stunted growth and precocious puberty, if untreated. Um, so if you have narcolepsy and you're one of those people who also have precocious puberty and it's untreated, your growth plates could close earlier than they should and then you would not um, reach your full height. Yeah. Okay. I'm available um, for you guys to come up to ask any additional questions. Okay. Thank you so much.